NTV Television Network presents The Other Day, Current Era, 1982. Translation and voiceover by BMI Russian. Good evening. Welcome to episode 22 of our series The Other Day, 1961 to 1991, Current Era. Events, people and occurrences which define the lifestyle. Things that we can't imagine ourselves without, let alone comprehend. Another year, another episode. Today we'll be discussing 1982. The Produce Program, Rubik's Cube, Russians on Mount Everest, a joint Soviet-French space mission, Dog Hats, Chancellor Cole, the Falkland Malvinas Islands, Brezhnev's passing, the first music videos, Soviet Adidas, Sofia Rotaru in the movie Dusham. Moscow's sports equipment manufactory begins producing Soviet Adidas brand sneakers which were dark blue with the trademark three white stripes. In our parts, Adidas was more than just sporting gear. Our amateur athletes covered in Adidas from head to toe participated in Soviet and international competitions like true pros, serving as role models for others. A reimagined old joke went like, today he's wearing Adidas and tomorrow he's selling out his own country. Soviet TV viewers didn't see any other brand quite as often as Adidas, with events being broadcast daily. Adidas tracksuits were suitable for any occasion, while Adidas sneakers were universal footwear. However, in Moscow they were producing an older and simpler model. Still though, it was better than what Caucasian bootleggers were making, where they would sometimes even misspell Adidas. Rumor had it that our paratroopers in Afghanistan were wearing these instead of the inappropriate standard issue footwear. Starting in 1982, Central Television picks up a second all-union program. Before that, the switches were tripped in Moscow, Leningrad and in the Soviet republics. But now provincial Russia in its entirety earned the right to choose programming for the first time ever. The second all-union program was available to 100 million viewers, with the lineup partially consisting of reruns from the first program. As for Vremya, the country's primary newscast, that was simply carried over. However, it did happen that a soccer game would run parallel to a TV series or a concert to a cartoon, which did lead to arguments about what to watch. While endowed households began buying additional TV sets for viewing the second program. On January 25, 1982, Mikhail Suslov died at the age of 79. He was the second most important party member, Central Committee Secretary on Ideology and the secret mastermind of the Soviet Union. In keeping with the cheerfully cynical spirit of the time, his death was called a great initiative, with most of the Politburo members back then being extremely old. Brezhnev's health also left much to be desired, so it was quite obvious that whoever replaced Suslov could soon become a successor to Brezhnev. Even Suslov's appearance, him being this dried-out austere inquisitor, struck fear into people's hearts. For 30 years he waged a ruthless battle against any and all ideological filth, with even party members regarding him as an orthodox Stalinist. Suslov passed the very next day after a message was issued on the death of first deputy chairman of the KGB, General Tsvigun. According to rumors, Tsvigun shot himself after discussing with Suslov the diamonds belonging to Brezhnev's daughter Galina. Suslov's grand funeral was a return to an old ritual established by Stalin for Kalinin's burial, which was then repeated when Stalin himself was being buried, to then never be reenacted. The memorial service at the House of the Unions went on for a couple of days, then the Red Square saw a slow-moving parade and a gathering next to the open casket, which was placed into a grave close to the mausoleum. In the ensuing years, this ceremony would be reproduced multiple times. The worldwide craze over something invented by a teacher from Budapest named Erno Rubik hits the Soviet Union as well. It was thanks to Science and Life magazine that the Rubik's Cube became popular in our parts. Its pages were home to an all-union correspondence club for those who admired the Hungarian brain teaser. Math professors developed algorithms for restoring harmony between the red, blue, green, yellow and orange sides. School kids were the quickest to solve Rubik's Cubes with 26 seconds being the record. Some people would go for a least amount of moves and try to form letters that would repeat on any given side. 
Life in Science magazine was where those who possessed a rich spatial awareness would share their experience with each other. In the spring of 1982, the entire world finds out about the Malvinas Islands, immediately learning that the proper name for them is the Falklands. The former designation for that archipelago is Argentinian, while the latter is English. The feud between two countries over these islands located next to South America, bear in mind that we are talking about a British colony, went as far back as 1820. And in 1982, the Argentinians, backed by their aircraft carrier, executed a military operation called Sovereignty. The British garrison was overpowered, and the British Marines sent back to their home country, with Argentina claiming the archipelago as their own. England responded with a reminder that it was still a formidable naval power, sending a squadron consisting of 40 military vessels to a place thousands of miles away from its own shores. The defense minister warned that the British Navy was instructed to sink all Argentinian ships within a 200-mile radius around the Falklands. He effectively declared war. UN Secretary General Perez de Coeller called for Britain to refrain from military action. Though Thatcher dismissed the call in fury. The British Navy blocked off the islands and commenced aerial bombing. When the operation began, the English contingent consisted of two aircraft carriers, three nuclear submarines, seven destroyers, seven landing ships, 40 Harrier airplanes, 35 helicopters and 22,000 soldiers. The Argentinians ultimately surrendered. These remote, barren and virtually uninhabited islands were from then on once again called the Falklands. England praised Iron Lady Thatcher, while the rest of the world was in awe at the level of material and technical support for a military operation at the other end of the world. Meanwhile in the USSR, they'd write about the imperialist nature of the war for colonial territory. A triad of settlements which became known to the entire country in 1982 with the rushed construction of the Urengoy pomari ushgorod pipeline. The entire world learns about such a thing as gas pipes. Bound by this contract, in 1984 the USSR would begin to transport gas from Siberia to Western Europe. West Germany, which would accept 10 billion cubic meters of gas annually, supplied large diameter pipes for the pipeline, as well as equipment for compressor stations. The United States strongly objected to the agreement, to Europe becoming dependent on Soviet gas and the tap being in the hands of the Kremlin. President Reagan declared an embargo on shipping equipment to the USSR for extracting and transporting crude oil and gas. However, West German companies decided to ignore their country's duty as an ally. We are at a compressor station called Torbeyevo in Mordovia, number 26 in the list of those which carry natural gas from western Siberia to our western border. Urengoy Pomari Ushgorod quickly becomes the nation's main pipeline, pushing the Druzhba pipeline into the background. Aside from the contract aspect, West Germany paying for our natural gas in hard currency was a claim to fame as well as the beginning of the natural gas boom, which coincided with the diminishing crude oil boom. For over half of the 20th century, the most important matter was for miners to embark on their battle for the coal. Then oil shales were all the fuss, then crude oil, the black gold. But from the early 80s and to the end of the century, Russia saw itself as a natural gas superpower. In 1982, two notable expeditions paid the Soviet Salyut space station a visit. The first time it was first French cosmonaut Jean-Luc Chrétien. The other time it was the world's second female cosmonaut Svetlana Savitska. Jean-Luc Chrétien was a test pilot who was sent to space after spending two years in the Soviet training center. Jean received a popular request from his countrymen to kiss the stars for them. While in orbit, Chrétien reported on fulfilling the request. Out of all participating in the Intercosmos space program, the Frenchman spent the most time in flight, at nine days. Svetlana Savitska chose to become a cosmonaut right after Gagarin's flight. 
She was the daughter of Air Force Marshal Yevgeny Savitsky. And as early as in school, she got into parachuting, achieving Master of Sports status at age 17, becoming absolute champion of the world in aerobatics. She held 15 world records by the time she was due to fly to space. Two years after this expedition, Savitskaya would visit Salyut yet again and become the first woman to perform a spacewalk. Today, the last of the fruit flies perished. In 1982, Komsomolskaya Pravda runs a piece about an event that occurred six years prior. Thanks to an article called The Underwater Battle of the Champion, the country learns the name of a new hero, Shavarsh Karapetyan. The editorial office received thousands of letters. As it turned out, in the fall of 1976, a crowded trolley bus fell off of a dam in Yerevan and in mere seconds was devoured by reservoir waters. It was at that moment and in that very spot where world record holder and European fin swimming champion Shavarsh Karapetian was finishing his daily jog. Shavarsh threw himself into the water, swam to the trolley bus, smashed the glass with his feet and brought the first of the people he saved to shore to then go get the next ones. He was able to save 20 people, and in 40 minutes the bus, which went down to a depth of 26 feet, was extracted. But by that time there were no survivors left. Shavarsh Karapetian spent 45 days in a hospital with double pneumonia and at risk of getting blood poisoning due to multiple cuts from the glass. None of the people he saved tried to track him down. The medal Karapetian received for saving the drowning would become his 131st and last, since he was forced to abandon his career in sports. In another two years, he would yet again be called to heroism, when he rushed to put out a fire in the sports and concerts complex in Yerevan, which landed him in intensive care. Women's hats made from mink or men's hats from muskrat or nutrium, this was furry headwear for esteemed folk. Youngsters picked up a new fad, colorful ushankas made from dogs, which they'd call hats out of buddy. Demand creates supply, and those who owned thoroughbreds were frightened, with skinners stealing their pets. Stolen material went for 10 rubles, while hats would sell at markets for up to 100. The public spoke out against this immoral trend. There was even a story about a court case against three scumbags who tore the skin off of a live St. Bernard. Soon state-owned manufacturers picked up the barbaric trade, which led to a drop in prices for hats out of buddy. Sharing one piano with the song's author, Ala Pugacheva performed the latest song by Latvian composer Raimunds Pals. Pugacheva's words addressed to him were, I'm in the eighth row, the eighth row, recognize me, my maestro. Pauls, a permanently somber and incredibly elegant man, received a second name which would stick with him forever. A light jazzy tune, the ever-present tuxedo and bow tie, and Pugacheva's record over Paulus' music made this maestro into a superstar. Rumors attributed him to a long line of Pugacheva's supposed husbands. Other hit songs they collaborated on were The Encore Song, Antique Clock, and Million Scarlet Roses. Maestro Pauls was the composer of the decade. Records with his music would be released by Valery Leontiev. And by Latvia's number one pop music diva Laima Vaikule. As you would expect from a super popular journal, foreign literature establishes its very own book series. Before that, the subscribers would be the ones to tear out their favorite works and bind them together. Translated literature was held in much higher regard than the domestic variety. 
From that moment, the best foreign works were published separately. Foreign literature's logo on the cover spoke to the quality of content and to readers' good taste. The first renowned foreign books were those by popular writer Ray Bradbury and the complex James Joyce. Bilingualism was emerging in Russia. Speaking English began to appear less akin to being a separate profession, almost becoming an essential part of receiving a humanitarian education in the capital. American never went out of fashion, with labels on basically all types of trendy clothing bearing English inscriptions. Records which were sold, bought and rewritten, those were virtually all in English, not to mention colloquial language containing a bunch of borrowed English words. Out of those, only 50-50 was recognized by contemporary dictionaries of the great living Russian language. The aforementioned records some would also call LPs. Blouses and shirts would be described using a russified version of the English word cotton. Then you had derivatives from girl, man, shoes and trousers, which were actually invented by earlier generations. A haza was an apartment, particularly a rented one, and a very commonly used term. During the evenings, hazas would host gatherings of peoples who would shake their hair to the beat of the music while exclaiming super. For reasons unknown, music had its fans, while soccer attracted fanats, though both enjoyed their drinks. You'd drink from a bottle, a word that also fell victim to butchery. As for the pinnacle of weird adaptations of English words to the Russian language, that would be everything is hockey and face into table. In May of 1982, a USSR produce program was adopted for the period up until the year 1990. The very fact that this document came about was admission of the country experiencing a produce crisis. The report given at the Central Committee plenary meeting was the first document to officially recognize that the demand for meat, dairy products, vegetables and fruit was not being fully satisfied. It was actually easier to list what you could find in the country, which was potatoes, bread, pasta, salt and sugar. The produce program promised to satisfy the demand for grain, eggs and fish before the end of the current five-year period, and to increase the consumption of meat, vegetable oil, primary vegetables and fruit during the next five-year period. The produce program bore abstract scientific meaning. Good luck finding anybody who unironically believed in it. First of all, communism was due to become a reality two years prior. An entire generation had been brought up that only knew stories about meat just lying there on shelves. Everybody was used to the fact that instead of bringing sausage to the people, the people sought after sausage. Traveling from Pskov province to Tartu, particularly from Yaroslavl to Moscow, also, party and government leadership, God bless them, most likely wouldn't last until 1990, and so there would be nobody to blame. More often you'd be advised to connect your fridge to the radio outlet. They also used to say that by 1990 any Soviet citizen would be able to ask for a slice at their store and receive their slice from a copy of a newspaper printed in 1982 that contained that produce program. During the plenary meeting on produce, Yuri Andropov was chosen to be the Communist Party's second-ranking man and the Soviet Crown Prince. He was formerly head of the KGB for 15 years. The first stage was planned for partially redirecting flow of northern rivers to the Volga Basin, but that didn't really attract anyone's attention. Most people were preoccupied with inventing recipes such as salad made using finely chopped produce program. By 1982, Lebanon had become home base for about 10,000 Palestine resistance movement soldiers who would attack bordering regions of Israel. The Palestinians murdering Israel's ambassador in London sparked the fifth and lengthiest of all of the Israeli-Arab wars. When entering the war, Israel declared its intention to eradicate all Palestinian military presence from Lebanon. They called it Operation Peace for Galilee. Prime Minister Begin was depicted in all of the caricatures as a dove with an olive branch bombing Lebanese cities. Israel supported Major Haddad's troops in Lebanon, Arab Christians who were longtime enemies with the Muslims. After Islamic extremists assassinated Lebanon's Christian president Jamayel, a massacre ensued in Palestinian refugee camps Sabra and Shatila, located within Beirut city limits. 
Israeli troops stationed in the Lebanese capital quite obviously didn't prevent the Palestinian nests being ravaged, with Begin declaring that he wasn't worried about non-Jews murdering non-Jews. Israeli tanks crushed the Syrian contingent in the Beka Valley. The remaining soldiers of the Palestinian resistance movement scattered throughout the Arab world. Yasser Arafat, Palestine's leader, suffered a crushing defeat. Our propaganda declared the people of Palestine our brothers, while condemning the bloodshed in Sabra and Shatila. What happened in those refugee camps was equated to the decimation of San Miu village in Vietnam. After three years of occupation, Israel forced Lebanon into a peace agreement. This was the latest addition to the list of countries that betrayed the common Arab cause. In 1982, Brezhnev visited Uzbekistan and Azerbaijan, bestowing Lenin orders upon these two republics. As was par for the course, Brezhnev was given a nauseatingly exuberant welcome. The news failed to mention that a huge platform with workers looking down at how Brezhnev was walking by fell over at the Tashkent-based Chkalov factory. Brezhnev was saved by his mighty bodyguards, though he did suffer a broken collarbone. Nevertheless, the very next day he gave a speech and was even able to attach the order to the Republican banner, even if only barely. In his response, head of Uzbekistan Sharaf Rashidov specified an astronomical figure of 6 million tons of cotton for the future harvest. The reception in Baku was a sort of pinnacle in orchestrating mass spectacles. At the airport, Brezhnev received an honorary citizen of Baku medal from singer Beibutov and oil worker Nagiev. Then, as the motorcade was on its way, the distinguished guest beheld live pictures depicting the labor, everyday life and culture of the people of the Sunny Republic. As the people cheer, Welcome, dear Leonid Brezhnev! As for the key to all of this success, it is mostly due to the party central committee of Azerbaijan. Brezhnev received a bunch of gifts. At times it appeared as if he didn't really understand what was going on. Finally, his the highly decorated Azerbaijan is making serious strides became a catchphrase. The party line. Which, as they say, hit a very specific target. A film called Dusha, starring Sofia Rotaru, hits Soviet movie theaters. Just like The Woman Who Sings, where Pugacheva was in the lead role, this was a movie tailored to a pop music star. It didn't shatter any records, but it did make the top five list pretty easily. Rotaru was sort of the opposite pole of Soviet pop music. Her not being a star from the capital, Rotaru was forever doomed to be compared to Pugacheva. Rotaru was the only person able to turn songs with non-Russian lyrics into union-wide hits. Songs like Chudovi Cry, Romantique, Melancholia. Out of all guests of the capital, Rotaru was the only one who was able to shake her ethnic minority image. Being a people's artist of Ukraine and Moldavia, she ceased to be a foreign language singer even before receiving people's artist of the USSR. I never knew it could be like this. Thank you. West Germany joins those leading Western nations with right-leaning tendencies in their political course. Following the laborists in England and the Democrats in the United States, the Social Democrats in West Germany, who had been in power since 1969, lost the election. West Germany's new chancellor was Helmut Kohl, leader of the Christian Democratic Union. 
France, with its leftist president, remained as the only exception that confirmed the rule. Soviet international affairs experts wrote about an Atlantic axis emerging, comprised of Reagan, Thatcher and Kohl. Helmut Kohl was the perfect fit for the role of chancellor. He navigated every political career stage and by that time had been leader of the right wing for nine years. As head of the government, Kohl fought against unemployment while firmly regulating the economy and managing to quell inflation. The victory of the right was down to the Free Democratic Party joining them after abandoning the left wing. The renegade party's leader Hans-Dietrich Genscher became vice chancellor and West Germany's most famous foreign affairs minister. A few Soviet mountain climbers who hadn't ascended a single mountain higher than 26,000 feet in the Himalayas decide to conquer the tallest one, Chamalungma. They intended to climb to the planet's highest peak using the most dangerous trail of them all, one on the southwest face where no man had ever set foot before. The mountaineers climbed from the last campsite and to the top of the world in groups of two to three. This one expedition was a fantastic success, with 11 people making it to the top, four of them at night, which is something that nobody has accomplished since. At the very same time when our mountain climbers got moving, a British-American expedition set off on the North Face. However, they failed to reach the top. The Soviet school of mountaineering, which previously had no weight in the rest of the world, in one swift move was elevated to elite status. Komsomolska Pravda prints a record amount of copies by including subscription forums and publishing an article by Vasily Peskov titled Dead End in the Taiga. Instead of choosing wild animals as characters, this time he went with feral human beings. The Likovs, descendants from an old believer community, lived in isolation in the Taiga 200 miles away from the nearest settlement, and they had absolutely no desire to seek contact with the sinful modern world. A hut which was five by six steps. A garden in the forest where they grew potatoes, onions, peas, turnips, rye and hemp for making oil. The Likovs gathered mushrooms and berries in the taiga, as well as cedar cones. The Likovs worked, slept and prayed. The area in which the Likovs lived was marked on maps as encephalitis infested. However, the taiga dwellers themselves knew of no other illness other than fatigue. The only gift they accepted were candles, rejecting soap, matches and food, which they saw as sinful. Polyethylene brought out their amazement, with it appearing to be a glass that you can crumple. Readers were astonished and wanted more. And so, with each new subscription campaign, they began to publish stories about those who fled from civilization. On November 7th, during the parade on the Red Square, he was very much present on the grandstands next to the mausoleum. But in the morning on the 10th of November, Leonid Brezhnev died in his sleep at his residence in Zavidovo. Despite the fact that for the last few years Brezhnev was in very poor health, which was something that the entire world was aware of, the Soviet leader's passing still came as unexpected, since the day before he was seen out in public looking no better and no worse than usual. The news on Brezhnev's death was broken on November 11th. A four-day mourning period was declared, school was cancelled on the day of the funeral, an artillery salute was fired during his burial, factories all around the nation were put on pause for five minutes, and finally all horns blew for three minutes straight. Andropov was appointed as chairman of the funeral committee. Uh, whoever manages the burial is the successor rule was established, which would continue to be honored in the future. The 24 hours between Brezhnev's death on November 10th and the official statement on the national leader's passing issued on November 11th in the morning were overflowing with rumors. November 10th happened to be the malicious professional holiday, which was always celebrated with a terrific concert broadcast from the Pillar Hall of the House of the Unions. No concert was held, without any reasons given as to why so. And as the hall was being prepared for, as it turned out, the memorial service, symphonic music could be heard on the TV and over the radio, with no explanation as to why. These were all signs that something serious had happened. By the end of the day on November 10th, the West was very matter-of-fact about Brezhnev's death. For millions of people within the country, Brezhnev seemed to be eternal. His 18-year reign was the most stable period in 20th century Russian history. This was an era when it seemed as if nothing was really changing, nothing was going on, 
But as it turned out, it took a rapid turn due to the most natural of causes. First the death of Suslov, the second rank and then the number one's passing. The summary on Brezhnev's illness and the causes of his death, which in itself was almost a complete medical encyclopedia, testified to the fact that the reign of the Kremlin elders was indeed for life and consequently finite. And Dropov assumed general secretary duties three days before Brezhnev's funeral. Whoever caught the live broadcast, which would later be seriously doctored, was finally able to catch a glimpse at Brezhnev's wife Victoria as well as his notorious daughter Galina. There was a moment during the funeral when it seemed as if the coffin was dropped while being lowered into the grave, but that was actually the first salute rumbling. A flock of ravens took off from the Kremlin garden, to which some sarcastically reacted that that's his soul flying away. In one week's time, a CC plenary meeting was held to resolve organizational matters. And Dropov gave a vague speech where he said absolutely nothing new aside from criticizing the Ministry of Communications. It was decided to rename the city of Nabrizhny Chelny in Brezhnev's honor, as well as the Moscow Churyomushki district, the Arctica Icebreaker, the Nurek Dam, and a few factories, army divisions, and squares. In 1982, three of the world's main types of sports saw the rise of new kings. Diego Maradona in soccer, Wayne Gretzky in hockey, and Garry Kasparov in chess. An era of superstars and super events with super rewards begins in the world of sports. During his very first world championship, Maradona put on a spectacular show. He also kicked a Brazilian player right in the stomach. For the entire rest of his career, he would be perceived as a super-talented brute. Argentina's team wasn't particularly fortunate during that championship, but Maradona was recruited by football club Barcelona to the tune of $3 million, meaning he had to move to Europe. Gretzky, who would later be called simply the Great One, broke the NHL records for amount of points scored and for assists at 92 and 120 respectively in 80 games. Gretzky was declared MVP by the NHL and Canada's Athlete of the Year. At the World Championship he was both the best player and the best striker. 19-year-old Grandmaster from Baku Garry Kasparov was victorious at a super tournament in Bogoino, Yugoslavia and later at an interzonal tournament in Moscow. He won a chess Oscar for Chess Player of the Year. In a time of unfading popularity for televised pop concerts, Central Television's most unusual program called Jolly Fellows wasn't just a few people lip-syncing in a fancy setting. Instead, they opted for artistic clips with an element of trickery. Viewers immediately noticed that this was something fresh, but they didn't quite have a name for it. The term music video was still used strictly in professional circles. Look for us, sings the Mafia. It's unlikely you'll find us, sings the Mafia. Thanks to screenwriter Andrei Knishev and director Viktor Kriukov, the youth underground movement found its way onto television. These were the types of bands that would usually play apartment concerts. They'd do their best to find fitting visuals, with the first Soviet music videos essentially being photo collages, where they'd meld performers' faces and silhouettes with landscapes and settings from foreign magazines. This was a breakthrough that people weren't ready for, with national music videos appearing before national commercials. And that's it for 1982 in our show The Other Day 1961 to 1991, Current Era. Events, people and occurrences which define a lifestyle. Next time we're going to be covering 1983, Andropov's fight for discipline, Yuri Antonov, we shoot down the Korean Boeing, Samantha Smith, the Soviet public's anti-Zionist committee, the US invasion of Granada, Yankovsky and Neyolova, images of contemporaries, 200 years since signing the Treaty of Georgievsk, the film Scarecrow and Teenagers, the Leningrad Rock Club. See you for a new episode and a new year. Farewell.